<laughs> With more on the countdown to the maiden launch of NASA's huge moon rocket, it's set for Monday. We are taking you behind the scenes now inside Artemis Mission Control at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston. Mark Strassman sat down with the lead flight director to talk about the historic mission and what's at stake. And there is Mr. Strassman again. Hello from Florida. Mark, good morning. Mr. Jacobo, good morning to you. You know, this <laughs> instant, the instant that that rocket behind me lifts off, control of this flight shifts from here in Florida to Houston. Now, there are no astronauts aboard this mission, but the lead flight director and his team know this mission really has to go well, it just has to go well for astronauts to land on the moon anytime soon. This is all brand new to us, everything. Rick Labrode works every day to give America the moon. Now 60, he's the Artemis One lead flight director, the guy in the hot seat guiding NASA's most ambitious lunar mission in a half century. We got to have a successful flight before we put the astronauts on the next mission. Otherwise, you're not putting astronauts on the next mission. You can practice all you want to go to the moon, but the launch is game time. It's going to be very different. And, then, you, know, uh, you know, you hear the pucker factor. It'll be there. <laughs> we met Labrode inside Artemis Mission Control at the Johnson Space Center. In nearly four decades with NASA, he's helped assemble the International Space Station and served as flight director for the space shuttle program. Analysis has cleared us for four ohms burns. But no one working on Artemis 1, not Labrode, not anyone on his team, has ever worked on a moonshot. I mean, we were alive, a lot of us, last time we put boots on the moon, but we were very young. Apollo 17, December 1972. Astronaut Gene Cernan's boot prints were the last left in lunar dust. Budget issues and fading public interest put an end to the Apollo moon missions and closed the book on one of mankind's great achievements until now. Where do you start? You just dust off the old Apollo manuals? <laughs> you know, a lot of our guys did. The guys Lebro took us up one floor to the stage of so much space history, the iconic Apollo mission control room. It's just amazing to see the technology and what we were able to do with it. In here, the United States I, I do, beat the Soviets to, to the moon using to, rotary dial phones and slide and rules. When you look at old footage of the Apollo era, what jumps out at you? Bermuda. Bermuda's green. Well, <laughs> it's always interesting to see people smoking in mission control. You know, we haven't done, <laughs> we don't do that anymore. Banana Reef, Banana Reef, the Network Net 1. But, you know, there's a lot of similarities. It's a laser focus. The flight control team, they will do whatever it takes to get it done. That part hasn't changed even the slightest bit. Launching on top of the most powerful rocket NASA's ever built, Artemis I will send a capsule called Orion on a trajectory to the moon. Orion will fly within 60 miles of the lunar surface, then push 40,000 miles beyond the moon for space high drama. It's glimpse back on Earth. After orbiting the moon, Orion will re-enter Earth's atmosphere for the mission's priority one test, whether the capsule's heat shield can withstand temperatures of 5,000 degrees, about half as hot as the surface of the sun. I mean, it's coming back at some ridiculous speeds. I think it's 11.6 kilometers per second. 25,000 um, miles an hour. Yeah, yeah, it gets really, really hot. We gotta make sure that that's gonna support the reentry. If Artemis 1 succeeds, it would pave the way for human flights to the moon, including a lunar landing later this decade. And how hurtful to the program would it be if it doesn't go right? I can't tell you that. I don't know. But it conceivably it could be it could end the program. It could. You just never know until you get in that situation. I hope we don't have to worry about that. It's my goal. No pressure, right? From this room, LeBrode and his team will both lead and follow the future of NASA's human space exploration, starting with Artemis One's liftoff. And after almost 40 years of NASA, what's that moment going to be like for oh you? Oh my gosh, I, I, I can't even I can't even begin to think about it. To be honest, with you. I am, I've gotten emotional in my old age, so I got to be careful here. <laughs> it'll be very rewarding. It'll be very special for sure. You said emotional. Why emotional? It reflect back on how blessed I am to even be in this position to be able to do this. Yeah, it's pretty, it's a pretty big deal.
Big moment for him and for the entire team. I asked LeBrode whether he has any, if he has even more respect now for the Apollo era engineers now that he's directing a launch to the moon himself for the first time. And he said, you know, absolutely for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is remember the Apollo era folks were making it up as they went along. It had never been done before. And then also remember just the level of 1960s technology. It really was remarkable that they pulled it off as quickly as they did and as well as they did back in the 60s. Jamie? It is mind boggling to think that that all was able to come together. I love that he called it the pucker factor. I, I can't imagine how stressed out he That's is, but he, he does have a little bit more technology, as you just pointed out. So Mark, Mark, that was a great conversation. That yeah. was he got fantastic. him crying at the end there. He's getting a little sentimental in his old age, but it is a really big deal. Yep. Mark, thank you.